Hello everyone, this is a metaphysical and alchemical breakdown of Jesus's Easter story. Now, have you ever wondered why such a gruesome, devastating and heartbreaking story brings people such hope? It's because Deep down, we know that the events and symbols stand for something other than persecution, violence, and bloodshed. The Easter story stands for hope, rebirth, and invigoration, the great regeneration, the threefold enlightenment or superconsciousness awakening available to each of us. How do we access that inner baptism? We're going to explore how key Easter dates, places, moments and symbols tie in with our own physiology, biochemistry and the inner alchemy of enlightenment. Following the Bible's portrayal, here is the timeline of events and symbols that we are going to decode during this video. Number one, Palm Sunday, the first half of Jesus's week in Jerusalem. Number three, the Last Supper or Passover meal. Number four, the Mount of Olives, the capture and the two betrayals. Number six, the sentencing, the torture. Number eight, the march up Skull Hill, Jesus on the cross. Number 10, the three hour blackout. Number 11, the temple veil tears, Joseph and the tomb. And number 13, Easter Sunday the day of resurrection. And now let's get into the metaphysical and alchemical interpretation that incur occurs within each of us. And we will start with the symbol of Palm Sunday. Scripture says that Jesus descended the Mount of Olives, Gethsemane, arriving in Jerusalem, riding a donkey or a cult. Crowds gathered to celebrate his arrival and laid palm leaves as a sign of admiration. So let's start by looking at the symbol of Jesus himself. Jesus is a cell, seed, corpuscle or germ of life. The man who is reborn in us is of water, lunar and the spirit, solar our own regenerate self, the Christ Jesus, the Son of Man. And that is a quote from The Perfect Way by Anna Kingsford. If you've read The Cell of Life or watched The Biochemistry of Superconsciousness Awakening, Inner Alchemy, you probably already understand this notion of Jesus being a cell of life. But basically, our cells are born in our lymphatic water systems, our light bodies. And that includes the bone marrow and the spleen. They are born by the union of lunar water aka protoplasm or soma with solar spirit aka nitrogen and phosphorus which are the formers of mineral salts in other words the solar germ electric pineal potency d in the picture unites with the lunar germ protoplasm pituitary potency which is B in the picture, and the breath supplied by the vagus to form stem cells, Jesus. This is where egg symbolism, Easter egg symbolism stems from. 
The sign of the egg represents potentiality, the seed of generation or stem cell, the mystery of life. So the entire Easter story is centered around the birth, journey, development, and transmutation of the Jesus seed in the Christ oil, CSF. Jerusalem symbolizes the cardiac plexus. From this point, spirit sends its radiance to all parts of the body. Charles Fillmore says, Jesus symbolizes our I am identity. So the real us coming to fruition. His entering Jerusalem is the last step of the great regeneration. When the personality is crucified and Christ triumphs. The donkey or cult represents animal forces, sexual energy, vital fluids being lifted up by the I am, the Jesus, to the spiritual plane of mastery, purity and peace. And the palm leaves, which are laid before Jesus, signify victory and resurrection. The root word of palm is tamar, which means ascending, high, spire, or a column of smoke. And the column of smoke description definitely conjures images of the kundalini fire rising through the sashamna or the central CSF canal. Um, And now we can move on to the first half of Jesus's week in Jerusalem. So scripture says that one of the first things Jesus did in Jerusalem was to drive the money changers out of the temple to recover the sacred nature of the site, of the temple. Now the temple, of course, is a symbol for man's body. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, scripture states, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? And the money changers are our licentious, greed-driven, material thoughts. Now, there's no sin in living a blessed life, but within our temples, our higher I am consciousness should take precedent over that money changing mentality. Um, And that brings us to the Last Supper, which is the Passover meal. The Passover meal commemorates the exodus from Egypt described in the Old Testament, which is also symbolic of the inner alchemical process. On this holy Passover day, the Jews were instructed to sacrifice a lamb and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They were then advised to paint their door frames with the blood from the lamb to prevent their firstborn from being killed. I mean, all of that just sounds absolutely awful. So let's just go back to the Old Testament and look at those symbols to parallel what we're looking at with Easter as well. So Egypt symbolizes the body below the diaphragm and the exodus signifies the freeing of the I am spirit, the new cells being born within us from the dominion of sense consciousness. The lamb that is killed and eaten symbolizes giving up the animal or carnal mind, sense consciousness, surrendering it. Unleavened bread refers to the element of natrium now known as sodium. And remember this because this has to do with the saltiness of CSF as we'll come to see. And I won't go into more details about sodium here because I already have a video dedicated to sodium that you can watch if you want to. So we'll talk about the bitter herbs and they're a reference to wormwood or artemisia, which 
it produces oils that eradicate intestinal worms and other impurities from the blood and lymph and endocrine systems of the body. So both sodium and the bitter herbs are a symbol for purifying the body. Christ oil or CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, is saline, which means it's it's a salt water solution. CSF is also alkaline, meaning bitter. So basically, the whole, everything, all the ingredients that are described for the Passover meal is a way of purifying and preparing the body um, for the ritual or practice of preserving and raising the sacred secretion. At the time when the moon is in your sun sign and your new cells are being rebirthed with each lunar cycle. So then we have the firstborn babies um, that were in the Exodus story, the 10th plague, um, and they represent pure, true thoughts, um, harmonized emotions, the personal eye of perfect light, love, and wisdom. They are the spiritual seeds that consequently imprint on and form the physical cells of the body in the great re regeneration. So those firstborn babies should be guarded and nourished. We don't want them stolen. Um, and Charles Fillmore puts it like this. The firstborn of the Egyptians is the highest concept of life perpetuation that the physical man possesses. When the divine word or angel of the Lord passes through consciousness, a transformation takes place in this life thought. If the consciousness is established in materiality and has no expectation of spiritual life, the germ is destroyed and passes away through the kidneys or bowels and a general physical weakness follows. This is the death of the firstborn of the Egyptians. If the mind is set on higher things, on the understanding that the enduring life is spiritual both within and without blood on the doorposts, then the germ is saved from destruction. It is retained in the organism, goes through a regenerating process, is multiplied and eventually strengthens the whole man. Now let's have a look at the timing of the Passover. Passover and Easter are celebrated during the first moon cycle after the vernal or spring equinox. The spring equinox traditionally marked the first day of Nisan. Nisan is the first month of the year on the astrological calendar, the true calendar, which of course coincides with the Aries zodiac sign and Nisan and Aries are known as a time of renewal, rebirth and fertility. All organic substance spring, springing into action. At the time of the spring equinox there is approximately an equal amount of daylight and darkness in a 24 hour period, i.e. there is balance between the polarities of light and dark at this time of year. This provides the perfect environment for new buds and sprouts to appear in nature, for animals to give birth to their new young. In the same way, the inner alchemy involves the union and balance of opposites. The word Easter has its roots in Esther and Isis, which 
both correspond with the moon um, and during each lunar cycle the moon goes dark or appears to die for one and a half to three and a half days then one and a half to three and a half days later the moon is reborn or resurrected when we see that first slither of moon in the following cycle easter is a lunar holiday the chinese hysian alchemists believed they knew in fact that they could transform themselves into material but immortal light beings at this time of year and they always used the symbolism of the hair which later became the easter rabbit or bunny and of course there are so many other symbols which are parallels of this in the microcosm and macrocosm as well Easter signifies both the macrocosmic, so the celestial, and the microcosmic, so the physiological process of generation and regeneration. Literally, the renewal of life and the birth of a new year or cycle of growth and expansion in our own bodies as well as in nature the prostate in males which is the skein's gland in females they both birth seeds or cells and those cells are literally raised through our inner trees of life our nervous systems and those seeds then can blossom just as the cycles and alignments of the moon and the sun affect tree sap in nature, they also affect the production of vital sexual essences, stem cells and CSF in our bodies. This is where the egg symbol derives from, as I said earlier. Eggs are a form of seed or cell and they have long been symbols for fertility, generation and rebirth. We're always being reborn from the inside out. This brings us to what's known as the semi-lunar or half moon ganglion, which correlates with the Passover festival. So within our bodies, we have the solar plexus and the semi-lunar ganglion around it and together they constitute a central hub in the body and that hub is in line with the spinal vertebrae known as t12 in the microcosmic inner crucifixion story both george carey and harold percival which who are experts on this subject say that t12 is where the spiritual seed enters the spinal cord and is therefore the place of the passover in the body so during the passover meal jesus shares the fact that he knows spiritually or intuitively that he is going to be betrayed by both Judas and Peter and that he is going to be crucified and resurrected three days later. The fact that he has foresight of this is a nod to the alchemy of his body or how clear it was or how when we become clear we gain insights or supernatural vision and we have a sixth sense about things that you know we we might need to know so the fact that Jesus knows that you know this betrayal is going to happen puts a bit of a dampener on the evening of course and nobody you know 
really wants to believe what he's saying um, but Jesus says that he's got to leave the party to go up the mount and pray or connect with God the divine so Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives to pray because the Mount of Olives the olivery bodies is the corpora quadrigemina and it's a relay station for I am impulses between the spine and cerebellum so that's why it's a place of meditation or prayer and we have a quote about this the creator dwells in you and his throne is the cerebellum prayers expressed by man in the cerebellum for righteousness are answered in the cerebrum thus by prayer to god within and in no other way can man overcome his adversary but basically going up the mountain to pray means an elevation of thought from the mortal to the spiritual viewpoint when the mind is exalted in prayer the rapid radiation of mental energy causes a dazzling light radiation from all parts of the body especially in the head in other words prayer creates such a powerful vibration that we become a magnet to manifest what we're praying for when we're truly speaking and feeling from a place of pure faith in what we're asking for coming to fruition Jesus prays, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And that's from Luke 22, 42. The cup that he speaks of is the consciousness of eternal life. It's obtained by the crossing out or crucifixion of the personal self, so the animal or carnal mind, and he's surrendering that to God's will for his life. It's such a powerful prayer. Not my will, but thine be done. Because God's will for us <laughs> exceeds what we think we want or need. In every way, shape or form and form, God's plan for our life is so extremely wonderful and divine that when we say that prayer, it changes things dramatically and it instantly relaxes the body and brings it into a place of harmony and healing because we're letting go of our clutch of trying to claw and control and plan every little thing and we're getting into the flow of saying okay bless me i'm open to that not my will but thine be done how could I possibly know better than the one who knows and moves and sees and creates absolutely everything? And this brings us to Judas Iscariot, who of course symbolizes sense consciousness, the material, carnal or animal instinct in us, which agrees to share Jesus's identity with the council so to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver by kissing him to say this is him now Charles Fillmore says when the new life from the spiritual fountain is poured into the body Judas absorbs so much of it that its identity and power are lost in consciousness, which is typified by the betrayal of Christ. So the new life from the spiritual fountain, which Charles Fillmore mentions in that quote, is of course the bespoke cosmic influx that we receive every lunar cycle when the moon is in our individual sun sign and the 30 pieces of silver 
again, signify that lunar cycle. It's roughly 30 days long, 30 pieces of silver, 30 day lunar cycle. And we receive this invigorating dose of energy each lunar month. So scripture illustrates Judas saying, the man I shall kiss, that is he, arrest him. And at once approaching Jesus, he said, I hope you are well, master, and fervently kissed him. As soon as Jesus has been identified by Judas's kiss, the council and guards seize him. And nearby, Peter denies association with Jesus three times, just as Jesus prophesied at the Passover meal. So Judas's kiss symbolizes half of the double cross in the brainstem. So there's a double cross in the brainstem which is formed by the Ida and Pingala Nadis which carry the pituitary and pineal potencies and the other part of the cross is formed by the left and right vagus nerves which are breath channels. Of course, the upright cross ties in with the cross that Jesus is hung on. But I would suggest that the diagonal cross of Ida and Pingala represents Judas's kiss, a key moment in the transmutation process because it's when Judas, the carnal mind, basically sentences not only Jesus to death, but himself to death also. The double cross of crucifixion is situated at vertebral level 33 in the medulla, near the entrance to the cerebellum. And of course, Jesus is crucified at age 33. So let's look at Peter and his three denials. So in the 12 powers of man, Peter symbolizes the faith center in the center of the brain, which corresponds with the pineal gland. And the three denials refer to the three days of spiritual darkness right before the resurrection or inner enlightenment occurs and of course there is a three-day dark moon in the sky also. For those seeking to preserve and raise the sacred secretion, your faith, which is centred in the spiritual pineal, will be tested in each lunar cycle, particularly during your practice time. But please bear with the process because when the inner light dawns, it is spectacular. Um, So let's talk about the sentencing now. Jesus is brought in front of Caiaphas and Pontius Pilate, but they can't sentence Jesus on their own because Jesus comes under Herod's jurisdiction. Caiaphas represents the intellectual body. Our intellect builds pictures from the facts and evidence presented by the senses in order to get a holistic overview of situations. But it can't act without the synergy of the other somatic divisions of the body, so emotional, spiritual, and physical. Pontius Pilate represents the pons in the brain stem. Pontius Pilate's name actually means great bridge and the anatomical pontine reticular system acts as a bridge also. Its fibers are a bridge for communication between different parts of the brain. The Latin root of pilot is pill, meaning to press down. The brainstem acts as a refiner's press 
for all the vital fluids that travel up and down from the brain to the body and vice versa. Herod, or he rod, his rod, refers to the spine and central nervous system. Just as Herod makes the final decision regarding Jesus' fate, the CNS supersedes other factors in the body by working under divine law for the ultimate good of the body. So following his sentencing, Jesus is dragged away and his torture begins. The first method of torture is scourging or scourging. A scourge was a bunch of small cords or reeds that were bound together in a bunch and used for whipping or thrashing prisoners. The metaphysical dictionary tells us that the scourging of Jesus is symbolic of statements of denial that cleanse the whole consciousness. General affirmations such as I am one with almightiness might not reach the error thoughts lurking in the inner parts, but small definite statements will cut into them like whip cords and erase error thoughts, emotions and habits that manifest life to our detriment. In the body, the scourging relates to the little reeds or cords, vocal cords, in the larynx of the throat, also known as cana. Scripture then says that Jesus is forced to wear a robe and a crown of thorns. He is also made to hold a rod or reed in his right hand. If you've watched my Revelations videos, you'll know that robes, garments, raiments, sackcloth, all of those kind of fabrics symbolize the many X-shaped chromosomes that make up our DNA, the very fabric of our own being. The four Gospels cannot agree on what color the robe was. Some say purple, others say red. So red represents the purifying of the emotional body, so the somatic division known as the red dragon of revelation, which relates to our lymphatic water system. Infrared light can improve lymphatic function by increasing its flow and the production of white blood cells, which also has a multiplying effect on cerebrospinal fluid. And you might recall George Carey telling us, the process of regeneration causes the white cells of the blood, so the CSF and lymph system, to overcome the prevalence of red cells. Therefore, the flesh becomes transparent and he manifests more and more of the Father. He is no longer a man, but has become a God. Purple symbolizes power and has a chemical relationship with iron. For example, iron in crystals such as amethyst is what gives them their purple appearance. Iron is critical to blood cells for the transport of oxygen and iron supports ATP, so cellular energy and reproduction, and it's essential for proper lymphatic function. To understand the crown of thorns symbol in detail, I recommend watching my video entitled Elements in the Bible, Halo, Potassium, Revelation is Elevation. In short, the crown of eternal life is the prize for those that overcome the carnal mind. The rod or reed given to Jesus to hold in his right hand represents the sushumna, the central CSF canal, 
the right hand signifies the activation of the right brain in moments of enlightenment. The intuitive, creative side of the brain is connected to truth and limitless potential. The next events on the timeline portray Jesus being marched up to Golgotha with Simon the Cyrene carrying the cross that Jesus is to be hung on. Golgotha is the skull, the place where the pinnacle of transmutation occurs. Simon the Cyrene relates to Simon the Zealot, but in a lower phase of consciousness. Metaphysically, Cyrene means wall, coldness or hardness. And these types of attitudes are transmuted in the great regeneration. Simon's willingness to carry the cross shows a surrendering from these cold and withdrawn tendencies of being. In the body, Simon represents the medulla oblongata at the base of the brain. And according to Charles Fillmore, this center is responsible for all of our zeal or enthusiasm. And he says, when you burn with zeal and are anxious to accomplish great things, you generate heat at the base of your brain. If this condition is not balanced by the cooperation of the other faculties, you will burn up the cells and impede the growth of the soul. That brings us to the cross, which stands for a multiplication of power. Uh, to crucify means to add or to increase in power a thousand fold. When electric wires are crossed, they set on fire all inflammable substances near them. And the cross also corresponds with vinegar, but we'll talk more about that later. And of course, we mentioned the double cross, so the eight-pointed star, which is near the entrance to the cerebellum earlier, um, and that is the place where the Christ oil is refined. So in the next parts of the story, Jesus is nailed to the cross by his hands or wrists. His cross is in between those of two thieves who are also going to be executed. So nails are another symbol of iron, uh, hard as nails or hard as as iron and iron also relates to ki the kidneys and the place called naphtali in the bible the two thieves are again the ida and pingala nadis um, which correlate with the left and right sides of the autonomic nervous system or the ans including parasympathetic and sympathetic nerve fibers I would also link the thieves to the black and white kundalini and the white kundalini force would be the thief that's raised to paradise and the black kundalini would be the one who isn't. And that takes us to the three hour blackout between the sixth and ninth hours. Jesus calls out Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani. Metaphysically, Sabachthani is the cry of the soul at the darkest hour of crucifixion. When the sensual is passing away, it seems as though man were giving up his life, including every good. The sensual looms so large at this hour that for the time being, it shuts God from the consciousness of the individual who is going through the experience. But God never forsakes his children. There can be no real separation from the divine and a glorious resurrection into a greater degree of spiritual life 
than was ever realized before always follows each letting go of the old. Wow. So the vinegar that Jesus drinks right before his death is a symbol of endogenous or self-produced acetic acid. And the alkalizing, foaming of CSF, which seeps over and bathes the brain during moments of enlightenment. CSF is part of the lymph system and it carries white blood cells. In fact, it was known as the white blood system in many cultures. The etymological root of acid is allegar, meaning vinegar. The Latin root of acetic acid is acetum, which also means vinegar. The symbol for the Hebrew letter Tav and the alchemical symbol for vinegar are both the upright cross. This vinegar is the wine that Jesus made from water at the wedding of Cana. Wine is vinegary, it's alkaline. But what does alkaline mean on the pH scale? It means full of electrons, full of life energy, electron rich. And acid is the opposite, it's devoid of electrons. But pH should be balanced. And the body is always working hard to retain our pH balance. But the fluids of the body should always and will always, as long as we're healthy, remain ever so slightly alkaline. Overcoming acidosis does wonders for the body. Even headaches and lethargy are often a sign of acidosis. My infused water recipe and the banana juice recipe that I shared recently will both help to optimize the body's pH. Not to mention apple cider vinegar is a great sort of source of acetic acid and has antifungal, antibacterial and antiviral properties. In the body, acetate, acetyl-CoA and acetic acid are all important metabolites involved with energy production on a cellular level. Scripture is referring to the vast alkalizing, energizing and healing effect that acetic acid has in the body. Purifying the liver and lymph water system clears our lens between the visible and invisible realms. This brings us to the symbol illustrated by the soldiers piercing Jesus's side. The liver is the seat of life. Proverbs 7.23 refers to it as the target which brings sudden death. In the book of Ezekiel, the king of Babylon looks into his liver as part of a ritual attempt to foretell the future. So moments after Jesus's last breath, there is said to be an earthquake and the veil in the temple tears from top to bottom. It suddenly dawns on the crowd at that point that Jesus was indeed the son of God. Now earthquakes signify shifts in consciousness and the climax of the great regeneration when the seas or fluids of the body foam, multiply and rise up and all of the biochemicals of enlightenment are being secreted into that CSF. So there's just this amazing sense of bliss. These shifts can really shock the system and revelations of truth can actually be quite overwhelming. And that is why the Kundalini comes with a warning. The awakened crowd realizing Jesus's divinity are all of our thought people coming into alignment with the expanded consciousness. 
The veil that tears in the temple is the veil between our 3D sight, so our understanding of this material reality that we live in, and our true vision, so our supernatural sight, which is our God mind, our understanding of the infinite spiritual world. When the Christed seed crossed the Nerth at Golgotha, the veil of the temple fell and the generative cells of the body were quickened or regenerated. Macrocosmically speaking, experts suggest that the full moon in Aries or Nisan is the time of year when the veil between the physical and spiritual words, worlds is the most subtle or the thinnest, which allows for greater spiritual insight and connection. Um, now we're at the point where Joseph of Arimathea takes Jesus's body and places it in a tomb sealed shut by a rolling stone. According to the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, Joseph of Arimathea symbolizes a very high place in consciousness or an exalted state of mind. And of course, the name Joseph and the character, the father of Joseph, relates to pineal secretions. So we could take his interjection as referring to the upgrades of melatonin into the biochemicals of enlightenment, such as pinaline and DMT, all which I talk about in my books, which are beginning to occur in that pineal center at this point of the crucifixion. The tomb that he's laid in signifies the cerebellum. The cerebellum clearly demonstrates the proper functioning of the intellect as it begins to move into Christ consciousness. As we become aware of the underlying activity that coordinates, balances and harmonizes every action in creation, the cerebellum begins to receive this picture. Then we have available to us the information that represents the total body of creation and we can become co-creators with the primary creator. When the seed is crucified, it remains two and a half days in the cerebellum, which essentially magnetizes it and switches or diffuses and resurrects its energy from autonomic involuntary power to the central intelligence. And then we have the rolling stone, which has several correlations. In the macrocosm, it can be seen at the end of the dark moon as we see the first slither of light with the crescent moon. In the body, it relates to DNA because the tomb itself is an underground cube a place of darkness and cubes are always related to materiality in esoteric studies. But the door of the tomb is a rolling circle, rolling stone or turning wheel. When the cube of materiality begins to turn it creates the dodecahedron ascension vehicle. The turning or ratcheting dodecahedron forms the invisible double helix or scaffolding in the light world of DNA. When renewed or expanded understandings of consciousness are imprinted into seed DNA, the whole body is rewritten, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. The rebirth is completed because it is those messages into the DNA that actually 
form the cells and then the new cells build the new body. And this brings us finally to Easter Sunday, which is the day of resurrection. So on the third day, the women, including Mary Magdalene and Joanna, visit the tomb to find the stone rolled away and Jesus's body gone. The angel of the Lord appears to tell them that Jesus is not here, he has risen. So the third day symbolizes the time that the moon spends in each sign for the zodiac during the monthly lunar cycle. Revelation 11.11 says, And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And of course, that's referring to the great regeneration as well. During those regeneration practice days, the divine essence, if not wasted, if not squandered, if not dissolved by toxicity, is raised and transmuted for super consciousness awakening or so Mary Magdalene is a symbol for the fluids of the body. The name Mary denotes water, the pure sea, which relates to protoplasm or soma. Um, and Mother Mary is a symbol for the pituitary gland. But Mary Magdalene is an anagram for the amygdala. The amygdala plays a role in processing oxytocin one of the key catalysts for pineal metabolism, the upgrades of melatonin into the biochemicals of enlightenment. And according to Charles Fillmore, Joanna represents abundance of whatever is needed to meet every requirement of man. All of God is ever at man's disposal for righteous use. All life, all love, all intelligence, all light, all faith, all power, all substance, all truth, all that God is and has. These are free gifts from the creator and source of all has endowed his creatures with from the beginning. The empty tomb signifies limited material consciousness disappearing and being replaced with abundance consciousness. And of course, the angel of the Lord is a vision or image of God, source itself. And it takes on different forms depending on each person, the beholder of the vision. We all have a different idea of exactly what that looks like, but none less glorious than another. So you see the whole Easter story is a metaphor for our inner potential to ignite and be reborn the benefits are felt physically, mentally and energetically and it all starts with your thought and emotion creating imprints on your lymphatic water system which will eventually shape and mould the new cells of your body every month. I wish you all an abundant Easter and may divine love manifest itself in you always and in all ways. Thank you so much for watching. As always, it is an honour to journey with you all. Of course, you can find the links to my books, to my course, which is on Teachable, and to all the other resources in the description box below. Namaste.